Hi, this is Arnold. Your instructor. Down, up, down, up, down. Hello, I'm Morgan Moore, and I think I'm Lauren. Down. And we have the skeletal muscular system. Come on, more energy. Okay, we'll cover both of those and then we'll pull it in. Why? Up, they go together. Down. Let's begin. The way our skeletal mu muscle functions is the interaction of protein filaments, and these are thin filaments and thick filaments. Thin filaments are the protein called actin, and the thick filaments are made up of mo molecules called myosin. Now, these filaments make up the sarcomeres. Uh, sarcomere is the basic unit of our skeletal muscle, and you, can you, see, you can see here that it's uh, a pattern of light and dark lines. The dark lines are the myosin and the thin lines, which are the lighter color, are the actin protein. And the organization of our skeletal muscle starts with the thin filaments that make up the sarcomere, which is this, and then the sarcomere connect into end and make myofibrils. And the my uh, bundles of myofibrils make up muscle fibers or cells which then make up the skeletal muscle. And here the sarcomere, you have the Z line where each sarcom sarcomere uh, connects and then the middle of the sarcomere which is the N line. And the, our skeletal mu muscle functions um, with this model called the spike and filament model. And this is when the thin and thick filaments ratchet past each other because they're not connecting, but one is on top of the other. So whenever the muscle contracts, contracts these filaments slide past one another. And some other components that are important to this are ATP, calcium, and regulatory proteins called tropomyosin and troponin complex. And you can see it here. The tropomyosin covers the actin filament and the binding sites for the myosin head, and then the troponin is also connected to the tropomyosin. And down here we have the myosin filament and the myosin head. Um, so the way this works is the re release of calcium um, binds to the troponin, which then dislodges the tropomyosin, opening up the, my, uh, the myosin binding sites. And whenever ATP binds to the myosin head, it uh, converts it into ADP and anorganic phosphate, which, uh, which allows the myosin head to bind to the actin, which then does what is called the power stroke and pulls the thin filament towards the, Z the end line. Um, and so the myosin head stays attached to the actin until a new molecule of ATP reattaches to the myosin head. And once the ATP reattaches, the myosin head releases the actin and the process can either repeat or relax. Um, so the process of regulating the release of calcium starts with an action potential. So the action, action potential arrives at the synaptic terminal or the motor neuron and when this happens, a neuron transmitter called acetylcholine is released into the muscle and it travels along the T tubule, which then passes through and it goes into the sarcoplasmic, sarcoplasmic reticulum, which opens up calcium channels, um, releasing calcium, and then the process of the sliding filament can begin. And we're going to show a short video that explains that process in a little more depth. You use muscles every day to do activities. This woman is using muscles to breathe, circulate blood, and move her hand to take notes. Your cardiac and smooth muscle tissues are involuntary. You do not consciously control their actions. Skeletal muscle works under voluntary control. Skeletal muscles are composed of bundles of muscle fibers. Muscle fibers are long cylindrical cells containing several nuclei. Muscles will contract or relax when they receive signals from the nervous system.
A neuromuscular junction is the site of the signal exchange. This is where the synaptic bulb of an axon terminal and muscle fiber connect. Muscle fibers are composed of many myofibrils. A myofibril contains contractile units called sarcomeres. Sarcomeres run adjacent to one another down the length of the myofibril. Each sarcomere consists of alternating thick and thin protein filaments, giving skeletal muscle its striated appearance. The muscle contracts when these filaments slide past each other. The thick filaments are myosin, which are anchored at the center of the sarcomere, called the M-line. The thin filaments are composed of the protein actin, which are anchored to the Z-lines on the outer edges of the sarcomere. Because the actin filaments are anchored to the Z-lines, the sarcomere shortens from both sides when actin filaments slide along the myosin filaments. Although the action between the filaments is described as sliding, the myosin filament actually pulls the actin along its length. The cross bridges of the myosin filaments attach to the actin filaments and exert force on them to move. This action is known as the sliding filament mechanism of muscle contraction. In this model, the sarcomeres shorten without the thick or thin filaments changing in length. A contraction begins when a bound ATP is hydrolyzed to ADP and inorganic phosphate. This causes the myosin head to extend and can attach to a binding site on actin, forming a cross bridge. An action called the power stroke is triggered, allowing myosin to pull the actin filament toward the M-line, thereby shortening the sarcomere. ADP and inorganic phosphate are released during the power stroke. The myosin remains attached to actin until a new molecule of ATP binds, freeing the myosin to either go through another cycle of binding and more contraction or remain unattached to allow the muscle to relax. Muscle contractions are controlled by the actions of calcium. The thin actin filaments are associated with regulatory proteins called troponin and tropomyosin. When a muscle is relaxed, Tropomyosin blocks the cross-bridge binding sites on actin. When calcium ion levels are high enough and ATP is present, calcium ions bind to the troponin, which displaces tropomyosin, exposing the myosin binding sites on actin. This allows myosin to attach to a binding site on actin, forming a cross-bridge. Calcium ions are stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum and are released in response to signals from the nervous system to contract. Neurotransmitter molecules are released from a neuron and bind to receptors, which depolarizes the membrane of the muscle fiber. The electrical impulse travels down the T-tubules and opens calcium stores. Calcium ions flow to the myofibrils, where they trigger a muscle contraction. As the actin and myosin slide along each other, the entire sarcomere shortens as the Z-lines draw closer to the M-line. As the sarcomeres in myofibrils contract, the entire muscle fiber will shorten. When muscle fibers contract in unison, a muscle can produce enough force to move the body, allowing you to take notes. Next, I will be talking about the nervous control of muscle tissue. So. A motor unit consists of a single motor neuron and all the muscle fibers that it controls. A motor neuron produces an action potential, like we talked about earlier, which, and then the muscle in the motor unit contracts as a group. And the strength of the muscle depends on the recruitment of the motor neurons that are activated, and this results in either fine motor movements or gross motor movements, which we are going to show you an example of right now. Go ahead. Next, I'm going to talk about muscle fiber stimulation. This is another way that the nervous system regulates contractions. As you can see here, whenever an action potential is released, it causes the muscle to contract and then it relaxes. 
but whenever an action, action potential is um, sent right after what has just finished, you can see this progression of the contraction getting higher. And so over here, you can see that the action potentials are released one after another, causing what is called a tetanus. And this is whenever um, the contraction suddenly rises, it reaches a climax. And then um, wherever the muscle contracts, um, and then it begins to fall because it can only hold the contraction for so long. Now I'm going to talk to you about the different ty types of muscle fibers in our invertebrate bodies. So we have primarily two types, which are oxidative and glycolic. Um, and the difference between these two is how they utilize ATP. So oxidative fibers are um, aero use aerobic respiration, and they have a steady energy supply, which allows them to last longer. They have a lot of myoglobin, which is an oxygen storing protein. And if you look at this type of muscle fiber in an animal, it is the muscle appears dark. And the other type is glycolic. Um, glycolic is larger in diameter and it has less of the oxygen storing protein myoglobin. Um, and if you look at this, muscle fiber in an animal, it is light meat. And I put this picture here to show an example of the oxidative and glycolic muscles or fibers in animals. The bird here has primarily oxidative fi uh, fibers which allows it to fly for an extended period of time. And here um, the crocodile has primarily glycolic fibers, and this um, allows it to be explosive and fast, capturing its prey. <clears throat> um, so in these two muscle fibers, they are either slow twitch Go. Slower. Yeah, that's good. Or fast twitch. <laughs> slow twitch fibers have less sarcoplasmic reticulum, and they pump calcium more slowly, but the calcium remains for a longer time. Um, slow twitch fibers last five times longer than fast twitch fibers. And an example here um, of runners. So you have a long distance runner, they have more slow twitch fibers, which allows them to run for a long time. Next, we have the fast twitch fibers, which you see in sprinters. And this um, is two to three times faster than the slow twitch fibers and it, they are brief and rapid and powerful. And these can either be glycolic or oxidative. Now, there are three different types of muscle in vertebrate, which is the skeletal muscle, which we just talked about, and cardiac and smooth muscle, which are presented right here. So cardiac muscle is only found in our heart. And this muscle lasts 20 times longer than skeletal muscle because it has to be continuously pumping our blood. Um, as you can see here, it is somewhat, it's striated like skeletal muscle, but the difference is that it is branched and it's connected by intercalated discs, which uh, you can see here. And this allows the action potentials to spread throughout the muscle more easily. The other type of muscle that we have is smooth muscle, and this is found in the, or this lines the walls of hollow organs and it um, surrounds our blood vessels and it's found in the GI tract. Smooth muscle is not striated and it's single nucleated. Um, it ge generates action potentials without neurons and the smooth muscle found in our body it contracts and relaxes slowly and it doesn't contain troponin. Um, now I'm going to talk to you about muscles in invertebrates. So skeletal and smooth muscle is pretty similar to how our muscle works. Um, in anthropod skeletal muscle, it's almost identical. As you can see here is an example of at antagonist muscles. And this is when you ever, whenever you flex your bicep, for example, your tricep relaxes as shown here. And it also or grasshoppers also have the same function in their legs. Um, 
But the difference between like amphipods or insects, for example, their wings beat faster than action potentials. Uh, they beat faster than action potentials have time to arrive, so they don't use that whenever they uh, use their wings. And also another example is clam mussel shells. They can stay closed for a month at a time, and they do this by a very low energy, uh, very slow energy consumption. And that's the end of the muscle part of our section, and now Morgan Ward will take over. Now let's take a closer look at the skeletal system. The skeletal system has a structure that is virgin, rigid and it functions as the support and protection for the body. There are three types of skeleton. The first type is hydrostatic, the second type is exoskeleton, and the third type is endoskeleton. The first type we will talk about is hydrostatic. Hydrostatic skeletons are compressed fluid in a compartment. When the muscles change shape, it changes the shape of the compartment. So an example of an animal with a hydroskeleton, hydrostatic skeleton is a worm. So the hydrostatic skeleton stays static and then the muscles around it contract and relax and that causes movement. This type of movement is called peristalsis. The second type of skeleton is the exoskeleton. There's an exoskeleton made of calcium carbonate which is a which is in clams, and there's also an exoskeleton made out of chitin, chitin that is a polysaccharide, and an example of an animal with this is shrimp. The third type is the endoskeleton. The endoskeleton is skeletons inside the body. Um, an example of an animal with this is a sponge, and it has needle-like structures that act as the endoskeleton. Mammals also have an endoskeleton. The endoskeleton is made out of bones and joints. When looking at skeletons, it's also important to consider size and scale. So I have two examples of an elephant and a giraffe. Since elephants weigh more, they are able to have shorter legs that are wider to support their weight. Giraffes are lighter, so they can have long, thin legs that will support their lighter weight. Now let's talk about types of locomotion. Or movement. There are three types of locomotion. Locomotion on land, locomotion in the water, and locomotion in the air. Factors that affect movement are gravity, balance, and friction. So locomotive on land consists of walking, hopping, or crawling. Uh, humans and dogs walk and they their locomotion is affected by balance, their ability to balance. Uh, hopping depends on gravity. Kangaroos hop a lot, so they have to have strong muscles in their hind legs to allow them to fight the gravity that would be holding them down. Lastly, we have an example of snakes, which crawl and crawling is affected by friction. So snakes have skills that smoothen out their bodies and allows them to move more efficiently without as much friction. Another type of locomotion is swimming. Swimming um, fights friction because water is more dense and vicious than air. An example of a fish that is fast is tuna. Tuna has a water dynamic body type that allows it to move through water more efficiently. The last type of locomotion is flying. Flying, uh, flying depends on gravity. So to uh, go against gravity, it's really important to look at the wing shape, and it also is important about the weight of the animal that is flying. An example of an animal that flies is birds. Now we will talk about how the two systems relate. If we were said made of just a skeleton, we would be similar to a gingerbread cookie, and it would be so rigid that we wouldn't be able to actually move or perform or do anything. On the other hand, if we were made of just muscles, we would just be a contracting blob of muscles with no support, um, and we couldn't move. 
Where these two systems come together is joints. Joints allow the, the muscles and the bones to work together um, to provide movement. Muscles need um, a rigid, rigid place to act as an anchor for the muscle for when they contract. Um, different joints, um, or sorry, our joints have uh, two different types of connecting points. There's uh, tendons and ligaments. Tendons are your bone to your muscle, and then ligaments are your bone to bone. Um, your tendons are your, are your key points that we're going to talk about here. Um, in our body, we have three different kinds of jo joints. You have your ball and socket, your hinge joint, your pivot joint. We actually have six joints, but today we'll just be talking about three of them. In your ball and socket joint, this is going to be your shoulder and hip. They have uh, multiplanular movement, uh, meaning that they can move on more than one uh, plane. Yeah. <laughs> After that, we have our hinge joint, and in our hinge joint, we have that'll be the joints found in your knee and elbow, um, and that'll be movement similar to a door or to a door hinge, um, and it's going to be in a singular plane. Um, And then the last joint we have is the pivot joint. Um, this has a single plane, and it allows you to rotate your forearm um, and also your foot. And so you can just kind of see um, here where it's a little uh, cylinder inside of the cut out of the other cylinder. Yeah.